alive. <laughs> oh, boy. Yesterday was kind of a crazy day. Um, after the show, after we wrapped up the show and all that, um, someone um, started cutting stuff behind my house. Um, you know, cutting a tree and all the shrub and stuff that um, was behind my house, uh, behind my shed, where the person behind me in the street over doesn't see in my yard and stuff, and <clears throat> it was, and, and all of a sudden, like, somebody cut all that down, and, like, now they could see right in my yard, and worst part about it is like it blocked my window where they couldn't see <laughs> couldn't see in my window um and now they they came in which is like I had to put up like a I had to put up blinds and stuff so it's kind of like the most fucking annoying thing ever because it's just like I have you know privacy and stuff and like now um, now it's like, you know, one of those things. It's just annoying. <laughs> Basically what it comes down to, it's flat out annoying and shit, so, for me it's just one of those, uh, things. So in today's episode we're going to be... Um, reading the uh, Superman Lives script. Uh, originally, the idea was we we're going to read the um, Kevin Smith one, but I decided I wanted to read the Wesley Strict one because I, you know, I've always been kind of curious about what Wesley Strict has gotten and his idea of a Superman movie and. Wesley Strick did uh, a lot of, uh, I'll read his filmography and who he is, uh, he did, you know, uh, you know, movies, he did the screenplay for the remake of, uh, Cape Fear, which starred, uh, Robert De Niro, Nick Nolte, Jessica Lange, um, Juliette Lewis, and uh, Gregory Peck, which was Gregory Peck's final theatrical film role. So, uh, and for those who never seen Cape Fear, it's one of the, it's it's a really good uh, 1962 film is really good, uh, which actually starred Gregory Peck, <laughs> Gregory Peck and uh, Robert Mitchum. And Cape Fear is one. Cape Fear is a really good film. I highly recommend that film. I recommend the Gregory uh, the Gregory Peck one because it's very classic. It's um it's a very um oddly enough it's it's a film by uh J. Lee Thomas who's a British film director but the film has a very Alfred Hitchcock type uh, uh, elements to it, but the the funny thing about it was uh, Thomas was a fan of Alfred Hitchcock and he wanted to bring in that Hitchcockian elements <laughs> in a film. So I I highly recommend uh, the 1962 Cape Fear. But the cool thing about it is Peck, Mitchum, and uh, Bowsman, um, Martin Bowsman, all reprised or uh, all appeared in the film, the remake. I don't, I don't know why. It's just like I always, I, I was never a big fan of remakes, as probably some of the listeners probably know. I am not the biggest remake fan. <laughs> Um, I did not like, I don't like remakes of horror movies, especially, I just, 
I feel like they're just not needed. It's kind of like the um, the Halloween reboot with Rob Zombie. Like, I love Rob Zombie music. You know, um, but I just was not a big fan of the reboot, remake, reimagined, whatever they call it, of Halloween. Um, I did not like the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Oddly enough, Wesley Strick was actually involved in that one. Um, I like Jackie Earl Haley. Uh, I love the Bad News Bears. Uh, I like, I love Watchmen. Watchmen was a great film. Um, Human Target TV series, which, which, which is really good, by the way. Um, I just was never a big, you know, remake fan of it. And, I mean, the idea of, uh, of Jackie Earl Haley playing Freddy Krueger is a, brilliant choice like like I said it was a very brilliant choice but the CGI uh, for Freddy and all that just was not necessary it kind of took you out of the film because you just look at it and you're like what the hell is this <laughs> because I mean obviously of course you're not going to create the Robert England magic because Robert England is a presence on film that you can't look away. You just know he's there. And, you know, and Jackie Earl Haley's that way too, but when when it comes down to it, like Robert England brought so much out as Freddy. He brought out so much into the character, not only the makeup, was there but he himself brought a lot into the performance the movements the stance when he's looking at somebody like everything to it but it just um it just that's how it is like he just he put so much into it and Jackie Earl Haley you know he brought the creepy element out but it's just like the CGI thing just sort of took it out, you know, it just took a lot out of the, you know, of the character and stuff, and that to me was the problem with it, um, you know, like, I, I never got around seeing the, the Nero version of Cape Fear, Martin Sor says he, of course, directed it, I never got to see it, I... You know, just didn't really have an interest in seeing the remake. But I love the the original film, Cape Fear. It's one of those... I, like I said, I love classic 60s, 50s films. Um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed... You know, I enjoy any film that's old and classic, you know. But I, you know, like I said, like... I highly recommend Cape Fear for those who've never seen it. The 62 version, not the... You know. I'm not saying De Niro is bad, but, you know. De Niro is a good actor, but it's just... Nowadays, he's just fucking crazy. <laughs> like... You know, so... So, anyway, for those who don't know, Superman Lives, the, they made a documentary, uh, John Schnipp made a documentary about the Superman Lives, and it's a really good documentary, I highly recommend it for anyone who's never seen the documentary film, it's really good, uh, John Schnepp, um, was fascinated with Superman Lives, and he did this documentary he collected so much um uh artwork concept art uh 
he just made like a folder and he collected everything about Superman Lives because he was fascinated with the concept and everything to it. You know, you had Tim Burton, who was going to direct it. Tim Burton did Batman, Batman Returns. You had three different screenwriters. You had Kevin Smith, Wesley Strick, and Dan Gilroy. Uh, I read the Kevin Smith script. I'm pretty sure everyone did an episode about it, talking about it. Uh, there's the Wesley uh, Wesley uh, script episode, which we are going to be talking about and reading. And there's the Dan Gilroy. Dan Gilroy was involved in a lot of the Jason Bourne films and stuff. And I never got to read that one yet. Um, I, I always I always wanted to read the Res- the Wesley script episode episode, uh, sorry, script. (laughs) I just always wanted to read it, because I, you know, he had such a very fascinating career and stuff, and he was also a a script doctor. He was, he has done production polishes for such films, such as Batman Returns, Face Off, Mission Impossible 2, uh, script uh, Wesley Strick's script uh, for True Believer was nominated for a 1990 Edgar Award, which is the Edgar Allan Poe Awards for Best Mystery Motion Picture. He won a 1994 Saturn Award uh, with with Jim Harrison for the screenplay of Wolf. Never seen it. <laughs> Uh, he was also involved in the uh, season two of the Amazon uh, drama series *Man in High Castle*, which is based on a Philip K. Dick novel, which I highly recommend reading. It's a very good novel, by the way. Uh, for those who never read it, *Man in High Castle* is a an alternative history novel that Philip K. Dick wrote. Uh, he returned to Los Angeles to uh, do season three. In early 2018, he worked on season four for *Man in High Castle*. I got to see like I think the first ep- the first season of it. Um, I just never gotten around to reading. I never got around to seeing the other seasons of it. Um, Philip K. Dick is a great writer. He he always does like uh. Element, he al- he always had uh, elements in a story of alternative realities, which I always found really fascinating. The idea of like an alternative reality, parent, uh, parallel dimensions, and you know, alternative universe, and all that. It's a very fascinating, um, very fascinating subject matter, which I always researched and stuff and it's just really cool um he he was always one of those great writers that you know he always had such great themes and story concept and all that and he you know sadly passed away and stuff and you know it's one of those so those things like I I highly recommend his novels and stuff. He wrote so many great books and stuff and it really like some of the stuff sort of like you know makes you think. It's kind of like it's kind of like the posts I do of like uh George Orwell's 1984. I post it on my personal Instagram account, my personal Facebook page and I always talk about that people should open their eyes and their mind to things <clears throat> and stuff so and anyway we're going to get to the uh, Wesley, uh, Wesley Strick script of Superman Lives where he just simply titled it Superman um, because at the time <laughs> you didn't know what the title of the movie it started out as Superman Reborn which we can't find that screenplay, unfortunately. Um, I wanted to read it. Especially when they put in the Lois Lane virgin birth of Superman 
shit, which is weird. Uh, we couldn't find that one. So, I decided to go with Wesley, uh, Wesley Strict script because everyone knows Kevin Smith's script. Everyone knows Kevin Smith. He talked about it and stuff. But the the front the front page of it kind of sticks out to me. Uh, I like the small printing right here. A John Peters Entertainment, <laughs> Warner Brothers Pictures, <laughs> director Tim Burton. Uh, it was dated July seventh, nineteen ninety seven. The first draft. So let's get into the first page of it. Oh boy, I'm kind of nervous about this one because I read the. Frank Miller's script for Batman Year One, and oh boy. <laughs> so anyway, the screen is black, fade in, interior, university corridor, late night. A young professor hurries down the empty hallway, hotly murmuring to himself, intensely concerned, a handsome man, about 30, very Dr uh, but dressed strangely. We are in some other country, sometime in the past, or in the future. Young professor, it's switched off. It can't be, but the readings, what else? The young professor reaches a massive steel door, like the hatchet of a walk-in safe, slides an ID card, it's emblazed, blazoned with a familiar-looking S shield. The door hinges open. The young professor pauses. He hadn't noted till now. The depths of his fear then enters. Interior, university lab, late night. Dark. The professor tries the lights. The power is off. Causing, oh sorry, cursing. He's got just enough time. As the safe door, sw the safe door swings closed again. To find an emergency flashlight. He flicks it on. Plays a beam over all the bizarre equipment. The ultra advanced science. Oh, sorry, for, uh, bleh, for Vanilla. Now he hears a creak. He spins. His voice quivers. Young Professor A.I.C. The flashlight finds a thing. Translucent ball perched atop the pyramid shape. It appears inanimate. Young Professor answer me and finally within the ball a faint glow the ball how can I um, you unplugged me Jorel remember recall the young professor Jorel looks visibly shaken Jorel I did what I had to do IAC your constant need for energy had become untenable the ball I don't care for IAC Jorel initials intelligence artificial cybernetic no longer say enough so I added the word brain because mine is so big. Jorel slowly edges closer trying to determine where the thing is now getting its power while humoring him. Yes, it is. IAC brain. Brainiac, the ball. Brainiac! Jorel flinches. The glow brightens. Within the ball, a smirking, holographic humanoid face fades up. Berniak. And I did 
what I had to had to. I plugged myself in to the very core of Krypton. Just as Jarrell beams finds a metallic tentacle snaking from beneath the pyramid into a hole it drilled through the lab floor presumably to the planet's center Jorel, as I feared all the recent timblers the four shocks trying to control himself but his voice chokes with rage it wasn't enough to steal from the university's nuclear reactor now you disbuilds our plan. The labs crazily shakes another quake. Jorel drops the flashlight, staggers back. Brainiac's hollow head rattles. It precarious on the pyramid. I'm kind of confused. I'm not confused, but I'm kind of like wondering in my head, like, if they did this film, who would they cast as Jor-El? <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking in my head, like, you kind of need... I mean, like, you're going to have Nicolas Cage play Jor-El. You kind of need somebody similar to Nicolas Cage to play Jor-El. You know, like, I'm just thinking in my head, like, who would play Jor-El, I wonder? It'd be pretty cool to, like, know. Imagine John Travolta. <laughs> In the noise confusion, Jorel grabs a torch behind his back, flicks it on. A blade of a blade of flame shoots out. Page three. The script's kind of like I, I like how it starts off. Um, you know, sorry by the way. Usually when I read something, I kind of like talk about it. I kind of give my my two cents in on this. Um, I like how the page is like kicking off, like it's. It's picking up steam already. Um, usually, that's what happened. Like, like, um, and, and this isn't a knock at the original Superman film. I know a lot of people love the original Superman film, but I'm sorry, it starts out pretty slow, and it's like, you know, you know, it's like a train trying to get up a hill. <clears throat> sorry. With um, but this one is just like it's you know picking up steam. It's like going. I I like it. I love it. I'm really into it now. Um, the shock wave subs- subsides in a creepily friendly tone. Brainiac, there is a simple solution, Jorel. All you have to do is give me K. Jarrell tries and fails to mask his stunned surprise. Brainiac. Yes. All these months you thought I was switched off. I watched you at your workbench creating the very thing I'm not. Prematurely auto-powered intelligence self-contained self-sufficient scathing perfect model of me K Jorel really advancing if there if that were true and if I were to give you this K Brainiac uh, for those who are wondering, K is sort of um, uh, uh, K. K was created to sort of be Kal El, Clark Kent, Superman's sort of confidant, um, his ally, his uh, sort of teach him everything, being Kryptonian and all that. Um, you know, how to be Krypton, you know, about everything about Krypton, you know, Kryptonian history and all that. So, so, sort of in a way, it's sort of like a intelligence, you know, educator thing. 
basically what it is. Um, so anyway. So anyway, Brainiac. I have an infinity power supply. So I'd stop poaching from the core of your oh so precious planet. Drell, damned right. You'll stop. He switches the torch out. Behind his back, it flames, slicing off a tentacle that bored through the floor. Brainiac hollows, howls with fury. So, then suddenly, terrifyingly, rises to his full towering height, a pyramid standing, crumbling, revealing slightly spidery titanium legs. Brainiac, surprised, startled, astounded, Jarrell stands with horror as the huge cyber scorpion Brainiac. I grew these on my own because I had to. Jorel backs away, panic, bumping into things as Brainiac stalks him. Lit by a dropped flashlight, Brainiac. To you, I'm a failed experiment. He lunges at Jorel who desperate ducks under those legs, runs for the door, fumbling his card. He just managed to get it unlocked. But the tentacle firmly planted keeps the door from opening Jorel's trapped brainiac. But to me, I'm a masterpiece in progress. Now one more, even worse, Quake. Brainiac teeters, then loses his balance, freeing the door. And Jorel re J sorry, Jorel races out of his lab for his life. Interior Jorel's apartment Dawn. Jorel's wife Laura. Whimpers as their penthouse on the two hundredth or so floor, judging by the Vista outside sways a sw swaddled baby in her arms. Kalel starts to cry outside the wall linked window, sees the planet's sun red as a child child's rubber ball just rising in the air. Jorel, come on, Laura. There's not so much time. There's not much time. Gently coaxing his wife and the baby upstairs, then over his shoulder, Jorel, contain, Jorel, you too, hurry. Addressing the glowing spear that doesn't ha need a pyramid standing or tentacles, but floats like Brainiac's head. It's weightless, shimmering, holographic. This is the pinnacle of Jarrell's scientific achievement. K. Exterior penthouse rooftop afternoon. Dominated by two small rockets on twin launching pads. They rattle as next shock hits, looking for a moment as if they are they are fall they fall. Laura steadies herself on the railing with one hand, clutching Kalel with the other, while Jorel struggles to swaying the roof open. Rocket One's hatch. Jorel, K. Now Laura, you and the baby, Laura. But I thought the family in one craft, and K in the other. Jarrell led her to believe. Now it's time for the truth. Jarrell, Laura, I'm to blame for all of this. This 
monster, Brainiac. He is in some sense my child. While helping her and the baby into the rocket craft. Laura, no. Kal-El is your child. Jor-El knows that, of course, right now, he's whispering a farewell message to his son while carefully strapping him in, making sure Kal-El is totally, utterly secure. He kisses his son's forehead, letting his lips linger for a precious extra second, then averting his face from his wife. Jorel quickly wipes a tear as he assures her, Jorel, when I'm done, what I when I've done, what I can, I'll use the second ship to join you. K. We'll get you there unharmed. Above all, in my absence, he's programmed to safeguard Kal-El. This is kind of a different take on the original Superman story. Because, you know, in the story, Superman, that we all know, kal the only one who goes. We never, you know, got this one. But, anyway. When... From behind, a tentacle wraps around Jor-El's neck, raising him five feet off the ground. Brainiac. Where is it? Where's Kay? Laura scrambles back out of the safe, back out of the spacecraft, closing the hatchet behind her. To console a safeguard her son, then starts thrashing at the monster with her hands and feet. Brainiac drops Jor-El, then turns to Laura and sneers. Brainiac. Why try to hurt me? I'm your husband's firstborn. While he taunts Jor-El, edges to console. And, and igniting the launch sequence. Brainiac. Which makes me your stepson, mother. Then scuttles towards the craft. But just as Brainiac lays his tentacle on the fuse latch, there is a shocking roar as the ring of fire below. And the ship, with its precious cargo, shoots into the sky. Laura, my baby... Kal-El. Jor-El presses Laura hard to him, forgetting himself. Jor-El, K will always keep him safe. Brainiac sneers. For a scientist, you always were a sentimental fool. He shuttles backward to Rocket 2. Rushing at him, Jarrell. Your everything Krypton wasn't. You must not survive its death. Brainiac murderously lashes with a tentacle, cutting him down. Then climbs into the climbs in sideways into Rocket Two. Brainiac, ah, history rich with irony. Laura screams down. downed out by Brainiac's launch as Krypton is rocked with the biggest timbler yet. She runs to Jor-El's body as the tower collapses, crushing her. Rocket to Dawn. As it climbs, Brainiac uses his mega Machano vision. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. To spot Rocket One, he locks onto it with a directory. When an apocalyptic bang lights the cabin brightly, everything is seen to be 
instant as X-ray Krypton explodes. The shock wave is more than Brainiac or his ship can take. It creates a blackout as his craft tumbles end over end deep into the void with a dip to black then fade up. Exterior space internal night super up 30 years later as the ship streaks across the screen a different ship and the ship with a grinning skull its surface studied with victims bones I've heard about the skull ship um it was really like one of the most fascinating things to hear about um and Superman lives the the documentary it shows the skull ship and it is like the most um the most craziest looking thing ever and I was just like so fascinated with the the documentary about the skull ship and the whole idea of it was so cool looking and and oddly enough John Peters owns <laughs> John Peters has the skull ship uh, that was designed for the Superman Libs movie, and I mean, of course, you know, like it, it. I remember in the documentary, if I remember correctly, someone said like in the the final days of production before it shut down, John Peters had his people come in and took every single thing that they had, including the skull ship. And he was like, I don't know if it's a rumor, but John Schnepp confirmed, like, yeah, they, he has a skull ship. It was just like, uh. and and anyway, it was just like one of those crazy things. So the skull ship thing was pretty cool. Uh, I gotta upload. I'm gonna upload the photos of it uh, on. The Instagram page Josh of Gotham for those who never who don't have Instagram, you can follow me there or at the one Bugs Bunny. Um, your choice, uh, but yeah, you don't have to. You have to follow, but it's pretty cool. Uh, I'll upload it. The photos of it. Uh, I know there's two I found. One is from the movie, and one is a concept art. So. Which is pretty cool, so, yeah. Alright, I just uploaded it. So, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, let's get to the uh, rest of it. Skull ship, Brainiac. He's shrunken now. And testy. As he tends over his menagerie, a bizarre caged creatures collected over the two over the three decades of the pangalactic travel to a two headed rodent Brainiac. You're hungry too, here. Eat. Brainiac undoes one of his joints in a lean actual food tossing peculiar looking bolt to a freaky space rat <laughs> the left head gulp the bolt the right head bites off the left bites off the left head what the fuck um <laughs> brainiac fine one less mouth to feed that's just fucked up right there that's very Tim Burton-ish <laughs> The better trained beasts 
all mutant beings, perhaps crossbred for the purpose. The skulk around as Brainiac's crew. He mixed. He's a mix of Drez and Doolittle and Doctors Doolittle and Mingle. Now, Brainiac, I need to refine the energy. Get me out of the backward galaxy. But anyway, but as North America comes into view, something catches his compound eye. As Brainiac zooms in, zooms in on it, we hear a wiring sound as the camera lens changes focal length. What he sees, we get closer to Metropolis, a Midwestern city with a big cinematic coned cloud spewing a power plant on the outskirts. Intercut Brainiac. Brainiac, wait, these Milky Way's anonymies. Have we figured out a nuclear fission? Barks a reverse. Barks a revised command. Brainiac, set me down above the biggest of those power plants there. Hide our approach behind that comet to the east. Fetch me my cape. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, that was very. All right, we're on page eight. Damn. An obedient beast cringly approaches with a floor-length velvet cape bejeweled with the color lights fastens it beneath his master's head hiding his spider legs. John Peters is like really obsessed, obsessed with spiders. Um, which is pretty dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just like dumb. Anyway. Ugh. Making him appear powerful again. In the meantime, Brainiac zooms in on more. Expanding the McChano eyes reads a logo pointed at the smokestack. Lex Corp. Here I come. Lex Corp. Conference room. Afternoon. Lex Luthor imagines the boomer love child of Robert Vesco and Leon Helmsley. Okay, never heard of them, but okay. Alright. Holds a packed press conference beneath his slick double L corporate shield. A slideshow that starts, that stars LexCorp Solar Provider sa uh, Satellite Le Luthor, equipped with a microwave. Imagine capability suggests that about 30 years ago, an ex extraterrestrial craft broke up in our atmosphere. Half one half crashed in the Arctic. We think the second large piece landed somewhere in nearby town of Smallville. Many of the reporters buzzly joke notes. Busily joke notes. Reporter one. How do we know it was a spacecraft? Not say a meteor. A panel of research scientists sits behind Luthor. One starts to answer, but Lex immediately interrupts. Luthor, heat, speed. Mock, uh, sorry. Mockler, destiny. 
absent of the cosmic debris. Next. Reporter 2. Mr. Luthor, is there any evidence of an alien life formed aboard this craft? The big question this time. Luthor sits, defers his his experts. A senior scientist rises and clears his throat. Senior scientist. Microwave image is still in its... Revelant infancy, though we can. Luthor jumps back up. Was an alien life form aboard that ship? I bet twenty. I bet my twenty-seven billion. Reporters marvel. The scratched pen gets scratch pens get louder. Only one reporter isn't taking notes. He's just listening. With a penetrating intensity, with a a bent penetrating intensely. Though this news had been meaning as personal meaning, it's thirty-year-old Clark Kent, Bisco, uh, biscopely squared with a tight. Uh, we go tighter on him and we hear Luthor but did that life form survive the spacecraft's breakup in the atmosphere its impact on the ground come on to not have been carbonated vaporized obliterated he had been an, he had to be another distastefully Superman. Clark frowns. Circumstance. So, uh, sorry. Yep. Then he moves away. Then move away from the camera, as he wanders through the crowd, continuing. Luthor's voice. Still, I'm sending my, I'm sending teams to both crash sites. If we can recover one of one ounce of E.T.'s debris. Well, in the scientific terms, in the scientific terms, that comes to a weight a ton. Just as he reaches, Clark is grabbed by Lois Lane. Her beauty sur- surpassed only her affirmation. Lois, trying to steal my story? Clark, just phoning in the background. Bylines. Byline. Be Lois Lane. Lois, you bet your sweet at your sweet associated press card. <laughs> and Clark exits to LexCorp Lobby. Clark is on the payphone here, dialing the planet. For those who don't know, a payphone is like a. It was before cell phones, actually. <laughs> Daily Planet building. Afternoon, same time. Crane down from the Rockefeller Plaza. Sorry, I had to sneeze. Ever since they cut those things, like, I've been sneezing. <sighs> I hate allergies. The crane is now from the Rockefeller Plaza era. As the globe that is greater than the papers, the paper symbol, as it call, is taken in. Perry White Kent. What did Luthor say exactly? Clark. And it- Analyzing of the data collected by LexCorp satellite equipped with microwave imag- imaging capability seems to confirm that a 30 year old, 30 years ago, an extraterrestrial. We land on 
White's corner office window, then go inside. Perry White's office afternoon. His monitoring monitor shows a mock-up of the late edition. Front page headlines. Border of Education Funding Fight. White Kent. Are you an idiot, savant? When I say exactly, I don't mean word for word. Give me the headline. Does the alien live among us? The question seems to give Clark a splitting headache. Clark, I doubt it. I mean, Luthor is a blowhard. He's always exaggerating. Exaggerates. Worth $26 billion? But he says it's 27 No. I'd say with the Board of Education story, not. White. But I'm Board of Education. And not your editor-of-chief. With relish, he deletes the dull headline. Types in, Alien Stalks Metropolis. Is anybody safe? But anyway, White, you'll cover Smallville, local boy, human interests, Perry White, sorry, Hick Town and Headlines, I'll send Lois to the Arctic, she'll think that, she thinks that's fun, Long John's, Frostbite, stuck in the, stuck in Tudor, Tutter with 20 men, Clark Grimace at his Clark Grimaces. His mind grain just got worse. Metropolis Street afternoon. Clark walks and steps with a crush crushed of pedestrians heading home from work. Some are tuned to the news on their via Walkman style radios. And words of Luthor discover, discovery spreads. Small crowd waits at the corner for the lights. Pedestrian one. But what? But what would an alien do? Who crash landed in Smallville? Pedestrian two moved to Metropolis. Pedestrian three. Well, I hope Superman hunts it down and kills it. <laughs> General agreement. Clark hurries on ahead of the crowd. Interior Clark's apartment that night. A modest, uh, modest one-bedroom bachelor pad. Only decorations of framed photo above Clark's bed. An elderly, kindly, starchy Midwestern couple. That must have been Mom Pa Kent. That must be Mom Pa Kent. <laughs> Clark packs... For tomorrow's trip on the TV without TV on, commentator one. Luthor's announcement, reactions. Lex, Lex's folly, or might there really be a monster in our midst? Clark packs a sweater from his dresser, hidden beneath another one, a photo of Lois Lane. Had some disaster getting the story, with tremendous verging. On worship, he sighs. Clark, Lois. He slips the photo between, slips the photo in his bag, between the two pairs of BVDs. I don't know. <laughs> Time cut. Clark's apartment that night. I sort of like how they write Clark Kent in the script. They write him sort of like, you know, a guy dealing with life you know and I really like how they write it so far I, I really do I think Clark is sort of this guy struggling with you know like almost like anxiety type thing like I, 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 I really I really think that's how they should write the character at times you know like 
he's struggling you know with with life I, I really do like how they write it so far so anyway um then he slipped oh sorry yep he that night Clark uh he can't sleep there's a cafon Conver uh, sorry, of conversation with his neighbor's apartment. Clark's ears twitch as we catch a random samples. Don't feel safe. Could it could be anyone. Go out in pairs. It makes your skin crawl. Clark gets out of bed in his boxers, re revealing remarkable sculpted build for a writer. He opens his closet door. There are 30 identical dark business suits there. He reaches for the nearest one. Exterior city street. Late night. A restless Clark walks back in his anonymous garb hiding behind heavy glasses. He smiles sympathetic at a metropolis's luckless late night citizens wordless coming with them in their loneliness their hunger their f cold their fatigue he rounds the corner here is a homeless woman gawning gnawing on a piece of raw meat scrounged from the dumpster. Without slowly, Clark fixes his gaze on the meat and intensely cooks it in her hands, delighted she devours the, savory me the now savory meal. On the next block, a tired-looking teenage boy unloads, a, unloads bales of tomorrow's paper. The one with the Alien Stalks Metropolis headline from the Daily Planet truck. Clark doesn't like the headline, but what he likes even less is now a dead-on-his-feet boy looks. Now as the boy returns to the truck, he double-takes his all remaining papers have been moved somehow to the sidewalk. Off his grin, we pan to an old lady in a wheelchair. Frantically works to get out of the sh get out of the street before a big bus barreling. Thank God the bus slows down now. No thanks to Clark. Hidden behind the bus, as we we got it by the got it by the tailpipe, as though he's. As though he were walking his disobedient dog. <laughs> Clark lets go and keeps walking, sleepless, haunted by Metropolis's biggest hero. And most fugitive. And most. Uh, as most. Uh, bah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Let's get to Smallville. I wonder how they write Smallville in this one. Smallville outskirts next morning. A press, a press bus speeds down the rural road past a farmhouse, mostly untouched by time. Press bus, Clark. In the window seat, surrounded by fellow journalists from Metropolis, Atlanta, New York, L.A., even some European scribes who wonder what they're doing in this cow town. As he stares out one of one humble home that blurs by flashback to Kent Farm morning a qu uh, quarter century ago behind the house away from the neighbors prying eyes the Kents have set up a fence and play area With a mini trampoline from Sears, they watch Clark, a very cute but 
maybe tad, shall we say, hyperactive, jumps up and down. Young Clark, Pa, watch me fly. Pa Kent, very nice, son, but not so high folks might see. Indeed, every time Clark jumps, he gets a few feet higher. Soon, he's leaving the top of the frame, not returning for one second, two seconds, five seconds. Ma and Pa Kent trade looks, astounded anew. Now Ma Kent laughs, which makes even Pa Kent laugh, which means young Clark is floating, floating above them both. Break into joyous laughter, too. We cut back to Smallville Bus Depot next morning. The press bus pulls in. Discovers, uh, disregards the, the journalists. Clark is last off looking at the scribes. From Ogi and Lamond, even because he grew up here. Alrighty, I guess, um, man, it's already been one hour and two minutes into the show. Um, wow, I guess we'll, uh, continue on the, uh, the script tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but, fr- uh, Monday. Believe it or not, because today's Thursday, and we'll continue it Monday, because Friday, I am busy. I'm busy those three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I'll be back Monday um, to read the rest of the script, and uh, we'll be back Monday, um, you know, like I said, those three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm busy those days, um, you know. So, uh, I'll be back Monday, and, uh, you know, so far, I mean, in the script, I, I, I really like the different take of it, I think it's really cool, I do have, in an odd way, I do kind of have a, uh, Zack Snyder vibe of it, in a way, I mean, with Perry White and all that, but, um, yeah, I, I really do like the different take of it, I think it's really cool of how they... Um, Wesley Strick wrote it. I makes me wish the movie was made. Uh, I know a lot of people always talk about how great the Kevin Smith script is, which it is. I mean, it, you know, there's no denying it. But for me, I I really like the Wesley uh, Wesley Strick take of it. I think it's really cool, and um, you know, like I said, like I think it's a really interesting, fun take of. A Superman, you know, story, and I do highly recommend it. I do highly recommend reading the script. Uh, so, I mean, for me, I, I like the the take of this this script of Superman. It's it's like what I said. Like Superman has to be interesting. Clark Kent has to be interesting to make Superman an interesting character, and I think. Unfortunately, with, you know, with, uh, Brian Bendis and, you know, company, I think he fortunately made Superman not that interesting. Um, he took away all the elements that make Clark Kent an interesting character. Clark Kent as a father, Clark Kent as a husband. He took away all that and just, like, we're giving you Superman. It's like, fortunately, Clark Kent is Superman. (laughs) So... Anyway, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, part of me wishes this movie was made because this would have been a different Tim Burton movie because we're all used to Tim Burton making this dark gothic type movie. It would have been really an interesting challenge to see how Tim Burton would, would have wrote, um, you know, super, how Superman, how Tim Burton would have directed it. So, um, anyway. I will be back Monday. I will read the rest of the script. Uh, we're going to be on the baseball field, so I can't wait to see how that one goes. So I will see you all Monday, and uh, y'all, y'all be safe.
Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, have a good weekend, y'all.